Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Dun, 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 dun. Dan, back at it. What's up, man? Hey, how are you doing? You all right? That was it four, five now? Six? Ooh. Where are we at? Five. Five, maybe? I don't know. There's so many. Maybe four. You're a very popular guest. You're a very popular guest because uh, people like your technical information. That apparently, they like our witty banner. Uh, they like me not being British and trying to fake like I am. <laughs> All I, appreciate, of the above. I appreciate that as well. But yeah, thanks for having me on. It's always nice. Like It's just finding time to do it, isn't it? But no, when it's on, it's always a blast. And I'm glad that people are finding it useful. Yeah, man. It's, it's usually so chill, which is cool because we have a pretty fluid conversation. Obviously, we're really good friends, so it makes it easier to chat than someone who I really maybe don't have a great you know, personal relationship with. But also, you're in it, man. You're in the trenches, right? Like You are very much in the culture 100% as a strength coach working in gymnastics. And you've seen a lot. You've done a lot from the elite level down to the club level. And you see really good results. But also, I think that you have a good you know, filter from the really high-level sciencey stuff to the, okay, what does this mean when you have 30 kids in front of you and you have to do a training session? Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's like work, you know, work with a, vet, a range of athletes, I guess, from, like you said, like elite down to, you know, just like absolute grassroots and just teaching them the basics and then sort of trying to specialize a bit in like what we call like the emerging elite now. So not particularly mm. on a pathway, but the aim is to try and get the athletes to where they want to go mm. um, as well. And then, yeah, like you said, just, just by working, you know, week in, week out in gym clubs, you sort of... Like you said, you learn to filter what's actually usable and, and what just sounds really nice in a research paper sometimes as well. So, mm. um, and trying to apply that stuff over in the most usable way when you've had, you know, a gym club full of 30 kids and you only have X amount of space for 45 minutes or. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so noisy right now, right? It's like in a good way. I think, I guess maybe there's some areas in gymnastics where it's so noisy. I get worried because of how much information is available on the internet and just constant YouTube drills and Facebook stuff. And it's like, I feel like on the technical side, the noise is sometimes not great because it's really hard to find what to do. But on the strength and conditioning side, I feel like the noise is actually a good thing because the noise right now is people who are open to new ideas, people who are really embracing, you know, a newer model of strength and conditioning and physical preparation versus 10 years ago or 15 years ago, where it was like literally just do body weight, strength, conditioning, weights are stupid, never think about working with a strength coach and you're going to get bulky and lose all your flexibility if you lift weights. I think we're in a different era now. Would you agree? I would say so. I think there's, you know, the tide of change is sort of definitely washing away some of that stuff. So um, you hear a lot less of it. There's a lot less resistance. There's people who kind, I, I think we're more at the point now where it's accepted and people want it. And then it's just how, how do you, how do we implement this? How do we get this to work in a way that doesn't, disrupt what we're doing but i know it's valuable so how do i find the time to fit it in so mm. it's exciting like you know for me as a, a gymnastics and conditioning yeah. coach it's an exciting time right so it's, it's it's just great to see and it's nice just that the the gymnastics community is opening up to to these ideas it's really cool because it's only going to benefit the sport it's only going to benefit the kids it's only going to benefit the coaches and everyone else involved as well so no it's you know you know there's work to be done but it's exciting yeah, it's cool because I um, obviously between consulting work and traveling work, like I, there's not a single college team that I've worked with and consulted with that doesn't do some sort of strength conditioning, particularly lifting in the off season, then also involves their strength coach throughout the preseason and the entire year. And so every college team that I know, the ones that are the most successful, right, are, are doing this pretty uh, not even doing this, but they're they're very deliberate. They're very intentional with how they approach their strength and conditioning uh, as a hybrid model now instead of just gymnastics specific. And I think that that has caused the trickle down to be like here in the States, there's so many people who look up to the college programs as like, I'd like to be there, like, emulate what they're doing. And that trickles down into the club level where now you have a lot of uh, general club coaches who are like, hmm, okay, well, maybe if that's something they're going to do in college, I should investigate that and start that when they're younger in high school and then maybe even like part part of their, their developmental uh, programming. And so it's really cool to see that. But now it's even transitioned to I work with a lot of elites and a lot of, like you said, emerging elites who when they come to me at 12 or 13 or 14 and they're like starting to get banged up from injuries or they're starting to maybe have some issues, the conversation almost always comes down to the communication between everybody involved helping the athlete and yep. trying to use an accessory hybrid model of, of strength programming one to two days per week to offset everything they're dealing with, whether it's flexibility problems, whether it's injuries, whether it's burnout, whether it's, you know, making it through the season healthy, like, and so now the, a lot of high level um, clubs that are having 
upcoming elites are very open to the idea of like, okay, let's get a strength coach involved once per week. Let's get, you know, let's go off site and do one day per week where I work with a strength conditioning coach instead of staying two more hours at the gym and just doing all my gymnastics conditioning. It's like, and that's really, really cool to see. You know, that's really what mind blowing is that 10 years ago, that was like, if we had this conversation, people were like, yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, I wouldn't have existed. So, um, yeah, no, like you said, it's just, it's just really nice, isn't it? Just, the, just some changes. Like, obviously, you have the collegiate system, so it's nice to see that it's, it's piling down and through. But you know, I'm seeing it in clubs that I visit with, where, you know, they're investing into that side of what they're doing. So they're investing in bringing a coach in, so someone like myself, or they're investing in the equipment. Mm. Well, so that's the biggest change I'm starting to see. Is, is you know, we're not just trying to muddle together some weights that we have in the gym that have been there for years we're actually like asking what equipment's required in order for us to actually have like a really effective program so you know some places have really big budgets so that's amazing so you end up sort of working in a pretty well kitted out facility and then there's other ones where you know we're buying sets of dumbbells but actually like you said like that's the tide pushing in the right direction isn't it is mm. we're getting stuff in the gym that we can actually start to do and and people are willing to do that because they see the value in it and obviously that's because there's lots of resources, so obviously, like yourself, like Nick, you know, putting some really good information out there that that people are absorbing and listening to as well, which is the important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's let's kind of start there. So, tell people for you know, people have obviously heard you in the podcast multiple times. I think with the last times you've been on there, it's been very technical, like what exercises, how do you build a program, how do you get strong legs? But I think for most people, they don't understand like what your role is with clubs and what you're doing. So, can you educate people on kind of like? you know, what your day-to-day -day work with clubs is and, and how you got started doing that and how it's developed. Because I think, like you said, 10 years ago, this wouldn't have existed. And you've kind of, for me, you're one of the people who has carved their kind of like name out and like the statue of being able to do that pretty well. Whereas I don't think a lot of strength coaches know that it even exists as an opportunity to work with gym clubs. No, I think it does. Well, it started a while ago. Um, so I, I used to work at a sort of prestigious university called Durham University. Um, and as part of that, I set up a youth scheme. And as part of that youth scheme, we found out that in in the local area, in the northeast of England, there was a like a, a club that had some athletes basically that were on a pathway that didn't really get uh, face to face support. They had support, but it wasn't face to face support. So we went in to see if you know that scheme could help out by basically providing an SNC coach for you know this is one, for gymnastics or just general athletes. Yeah, yeah gymnastics club. Um, so it was in partnership with the university. So yeah, we would we would go in once a week, um, and I was the one that went in. So hey. yeah, and that was it really. Like I sort of went in, and it was just foreign. It was an absolute alien environment. Um, you know, at the time I was heavily involved in rugby, so completely different age groups, mentalities, the coaching styles, completely different. Um, and that's where it all started out really. And then that's how I actually ended up meeting my good friend Nick. Basically, is that he he would then come in and visit at the club um and then that's where me and him hit it off because he had a really big interest in it i needed to learn significantly more about gymnastics a lot more than i knew um and we basically just started to trade information weekly and then it was like you know calls outside of work and it just came more and more until actually you know i was like well this is actually something i really want to pursue and i think it's it's relevant and it took a couple of years to get to that point really i remember saying to you i think at a conference i was like i'm going to do it I remember having a very clear, like, this is happening. Um, and then from there, it was just a case of going to the clubs that that were the early adopters of it, the ones that had listened to some of the, the earlier stuff that was coming out and that they were keen to get someone involved. So my day-to-day -day or my week-to-week -week now is that I will be going and visiting clubs on the regular. So I have some regular clubs that I work with monthly. I will go and visit them once to twice a month, um, and we will look at just – trying to support that club like long term so we call it like a long-term relationship with the club so like I'm, I'm with that club for a significant amount of time trying to develop everyone through from you know the the performance side all the way through and hopefully letting that information trickle down through to the coaches and then I do other things where I'll do what I call like a one-off visit so if someone would like a, a workshop or someone to come and look at the program or offer some advice I will go in for a day and just try and do, offer as much value as I can for the day. It's normally a little bit more educational rather than coaching on that side. Um, but I like to do a bit of both because it's always nice to work with the gymnast as well. So, sure. um, but that's, yeah, that's how, yeah. that's what it looks like. It's a massive, you know, for, for SFC coaches, it's a huge opportunity, mm. uh, but it comes at a cost of, 
it's a very technical sport with mm. very specific demands that you're that you're not used to if you're working in other sports. For example, the athletes go upside down is the first thing that you have to get your head around. Um, and it takes a while to like com- configure that. You know, I worked in a sport where they ran and then they would run into each other occasionally and then they'd run some more. <laughs> and then I was in an environment where there's a little girl swinging around upside down on a bar and I have to sort of flip my, my knowledge to figure out just what is actually going on. Mm. Uh, so it requires a bit of effort on the S&C coach's side as well. It's not just a one-sided thing of the coach bringing you in. It's a, you've got to get in and, and absorb the sport. And I was very fortunate, like I said, to be surrounded by someone uh, like Nick from like my sort of early experience of it. So we, you know, I learned a lot very, very quickly. So I was very, very fortunate, really. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to kind of highlight here how early on, you know, I think the pendulum swung so hard in either direction. So we had on one side, we had, it was like all body weight, never talk to a strength coach. They're going to get bulky, lose their flexibility. This is a waste of time. Like, don't do it. And then I think in the last 10 years, we've seen more and more emergence of whether it's the college programs, whether it's, you know, the work that people are doing around the world, like Nick to promote some of the things that, you know, are maybe more new school and against the grain, but now, and then the pendulum kind of went the other way, I guess, like in the, you know, first couple of years, which is like, people got a little bit too, uh, trigger happy, I think with doing so much, uh, lifting and stuff like that, that like they lost sight of how important it is to do technical gymnastic strength and to do body weight strength. And so now we've settled in the middle where again, everywhere that I work with and the places that I think are really, really successful kind of use this hybrid model we've all built together, which is, you know, biasing more or less into the gymnastic specific bucket or the general bucket based on the time of season. So off season, you might be doing 50, 50, you know, versus preseason, you're doing, you know, 75, 25 of more gymnastic specific stuff for 75%. And then maybe one day, or you sprinkle in here and there some strength stuff that's kind of 25%. And then in season, the goal is to compete well. And the goal is to, you know, reach your goals. So maybe you don't focus as much on the general stuff, but I think we've never, we've never lost, wanted to lose sight of gymnastics specific stuff, right? Like it's always been like every club that we work with or promote, it's like some sort of like Nick has a daily dozen, like that has to be in every single day. We have some sort of gymnastics specific core work and shaping every single day, event side stations every single day. So even if you are doing a full day of 45 minutes of a lifting program, you've still gotten a bunch of gymnastics specific strength in that workout and in that week. So it's not like you're losing it. And I think that's probably the most beneficial approach that I've seen, particularly from a periodization model. So I don't know, is that still what you're seeing in the community or is that different? Is it changing based on your experiences? Like what have you been, what have you been going through? Yeah. Like I, you know, the clubs I work with and I have a regular arrangement with, you know, we talk about trying to create athletes as well as gymnasts. Mm. So in order to do that, you need to be doing something outside of gymnastics um, in terms of like that general prep work. But like you said, it's never losing sight of what the reason for doing that general prep work is for which is that we always come back to the sport. So, you know, is what we're doing affecting the gymnast? Because if it isn't, it's not relevant. Mm. Um, and then, the, yeah, the other one is obviously, it, it used to be that there was a very clear line of, you would do this and then we'll do this. And what I try and do is just try and blur the lines. So when I do like a six hour visit, for example, I'm there for the full six hours. Mm. Whether that's the physical prep warm up, whether that's the gymnastics warm up, you know, whether that's watching them do technical skills and standing side by side with the coach, all the way to you know the last forty five minutes hour of the day where I do my general general prep work with them, um, because that's it's all physical preparation. Therefore, as an SSE coach, my opinion is you should be involved in a lot of it. Mm-hmm. What I mean by involved is there's bits where you lead, and then there's bits where you very much are just there to support if required. So standing there and just watching and absorbing and offering an opinion if asked or you know trying to problem solve with the coaches or what other support staff are there Mm. so yeah it's that that was my thing very quickly is it was trying to just expand and push and blur the edges of what that black and white was to as much gray as possible of what my involvement is and and the reason i'm involved is because it gives me a bigger picture of what's going on so uh, I'm always trying to learn more myself. And the only way I'm going to learn more is obviously by sort of putting myself more and more into the sport. But also it's vital to work with the coaches that you're working with. This isn't a siloed approach. Like I don't just go in and work on my own and then drive home at the end of the day. Like I work side by side with the coaches that I work with. Mm-hmm. And I'm really fortunate because the coaches I work with obviously want me to be there. Um, but they're also really open to the idea of having that hybrid model. Mm. So when they're really open to that idea, there's just less barriers for entry. So they they want to implement it. They're open to suggestion. 
And then it's just a case of finding a way that works the best to make sure that the gymnasts and it's an athlete centered thing at the end of the day are getting the most out of it. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm really happy you mentioned that too, about how important it is to kind of, like you said, stand side by side and either coach together or watch together or vice versa. I think that a lot of people approach me from like either a medical provider point of view or a strength conditioning point of view. And they say like, how do I get my foot in the door with these gym clubs? How do I get someone to kind of believe in maybe a new idea or some new models? And the first thing I say is if the club is clearly resistant and doesn't care about you or value you or just puts you in the corner and doesn't want to talk to you at all, don't invest your time in that club. There's a lot of clubs that I tried to work with and tried to get involved with and they couldn't give a shit, honestly. Like they, like I've tried so hard to try to open their eyes and try to give them new ideas and try to think about, hey, what do you think about this? This is kind of some new ideas and they do not want to hear it. So it's like, I used to try to force that a little bit too much and get a, get like, you know, extra, extra, I guess is the only way to put it is like try to put more into it and it never went well. It's like, this is not a good fit. This is not going to work. Spend your time on the clubs that are, want to be open-minded and want to be invested and want to kind of share and kind of try something new. Yeah. But that being said is that whether you're trying to go in there and, and build trust and build community, just standing by the coach and watching and listening and learning and asking what they're thinking and asking what they think the problems are in the gym club with performance or strength or flexibility or injuries, that's going to give them more of an, uh, a willingness to want to share information and build that rapport and that trust. But then also is that for someone who's really trying to get like really, really good at this, like be an awesome strength conditioning coach that works in gymnastics is you have to have a really good technical knowledge of what skills they're doing. You have to understand the lingo. You have to understand the cultural differences of why it's important to kind of walk through those. And yeah. as, if, as you're someone who like you is in the club, that's very easy to do. But in our setting to a champion, for example, we have 30 to 45 gymnasts who come throughout the summer and either are coming there, they're working out with us and Duesh is writing their programming. They're working with me for maintenance care. We're consulting about what they can do at the gym. So we don't see their coaches every single day, but we are extremely forward thinking, trying to reach out to those people and talk to those people about the benefits of what we're doing and why it's so important. So Duesh has done what you did. And he studied the skills. He talked to people. He got videos. He watched meets. He watched competitions. He talked with the athletes. And now he's got a rolling start to what's going on. But whether you're in the club submerged or whether they're coming to you as an offsite facility where they train once per week, if you don't take the forward effort to try to make a communication and really understand what they're going for, they're never going to follow your, your ideas because gymnastics has unfortunately had a lot of really uh, not great strength coaches try to force their way into giving them a football program or a rugby program and it doesn't really go well at all. Yeah, I just think if you have to use the word force in anything, um, it's not, you know, that that completely defeats the object of, of having a coaching relationship and, and being support staff. And, um, you know, it's a two-way thing. Like from a technical coach point of view, I think it's really important to be really open-minded to this stuff, which I think is amazing. I think it's definitely happening a lot more. Um, but then from an SSC culture point of view, it's remembering what your role is and it comes from a place of enthusiasm that you end up doing too much or you try and get too involved or, you know, it, it comes from a good place, but actually you always have to bring it back to as an SSC coach, like what is your role within that club? Each, each role is different within each club, I would probably say, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you fall under the category of support staff. So, you know, there's a head coach that everyone works around as opposed to down from, but around. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, you're there to truly support it using the knowledge and the sort of specific skills that you have so yes you can write the best world you know the best strength program in the world but also like what else can you do like mm -hmm. what else can you offer so you would think as an ssc coach you would have some good idea of like some kinetic chain principles if you do you can probably help an athlete get better overhead mm -hmm. so if you can get help an athlete get better overhead you're going to probably be a coach's best friend yeah so you know or if you can get them to you know open their hips a little bit more similarly so now you're starting to use your knowledge in a way that is actually supportive, right? You know, you're, you're, you're impacting the athlete. All the coach cares about is the athlete improving and doing it in a healthy manner. Mm. So, you know, we're not just there to teach them to like stand up and down with weights. You know, that's a big part of what we do and it's really fundamental and I'm never going to stop doing it. But also we have other strings to our bow that we can certainly use. And it's just how do you use that in that unique environment? And that's why I have what I call that integrated approach. So mm -hmm. standing side by side with the coach and, and rolling our sleeves up and helping out best we can. Yeah, I do really like that you said that because the more versatile that you can make yourself as a strength conditioning coach, the better you're going to serve the community, but also the more valuable you're going to be, right? So like you said, if you just go in and you can only write a strength program and just monitor the strength program, you're going to be very limited in your ability. But 
if you take the time to study, like you said, flexibility and you understand overhead mobility and, and hip mobility, and you can take those things to break down and you become someone who also can benefit, you know, their mobility, their flexibility, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's another like little notch in your tool belt that you have to pull out and be assisted with. Also, a lot of people are curious about warmups and sequencing warmups and building a good warmup program. If you can also be someone who studies the literature on, you know, dynamic warmups and understands how to properly sequence that, but also combines that with a good gymnastic specific uh, basics and warmups, you can then be extremely valuable on that side. And then even more, I think that monitoring and workloads and athlete wellness is another massive tool that strength coaches have a really, really good understanding of about tracking sleep and mood and readiness and doing some basic workload monitoring with session RPEs. If you can become someone who understands how to write a great strength program that's built around getting explosive power for the season, you can also do a little bit of flexibility. You can do a little bit of warmups. You can do a little bit of monitoring and wellness stuff. You can also maybe do some stuff on injury uh, risk mitigation with, you know, landing mechanics and some just like grunt work type stuff. You maybe have a little bit of a medical flair to you that you can, you can understand that literature you're going to be an absolute monster. Like I would like, if I was a gym club owner and I had someone who could give me those five things, I would put them on staff immediately. Yeah. Uh, just because you, you're getting the support you need, which means that then you can, you know, get back to the task in hand, which is the most difficult job in the world is coaching gymnastics. So, you know, get that support staff in, get them supporting them using the knowledge they have and then work with them as opposed to trying to learn what they, you know, went to university or college to do for four years, mm. you know? So, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Like I, I enjoy talking about this stuff because it's, you know, part of my frustration sometimes with the SC stuff is that, you know, we need to branch out and get better and make sure that we're providing value the right way and being supportive, but also just the opportunity is there because people need it and the sport needs it and the gymnasts require it. So, you yeah. know, I'm really, like I said, I'm, I keep saying it, but I'm really fortunate to work with the clubs I do because they are just so open-minded and, we have that really strong working relationship, which I think is really, really important. Yeah. I'm curious your thoughts. I want to maybe share what's been successful with me when you do try to get your foot in the door and you're trying to get someone to to buy in, I guess is the way to do it. Cause that's honestly one of the hardest things that goes on is from a coach's point of view. And I understand this, right? Cause I, I went through this. It's like when you're looking for someone to work with, it's really, it's tough to give your time and your effort and your energy into something. You're not sure if it's going to work or not like that. And it's going to make a big opinion, but then it's mm -hmm. a strength conditioning coach it's really hard to sometimes buy buy-in from the coaches to, you know, think about giving them time or effort. So for me, I've always tried to counsel people that I think the more you can talk about performance, the better. I think a lot of times injuries is what people are maybe trying to get a, a, a dent at, but it doesn't always work out. So when you ask somebody like, what do you think are the biggest struggles or frustrations with the athletes in your clubs? They're probably going to tell you uh, they don't jump high enough. They don't run fast enough. Their flexibility is limited and, you know, they don't seem to get their skills faster or have good form, right? What is good form? Good form is strength and flexibility, right? Like in technique work combined. So that's kind of a, a low hanging fruit where you can be like, okay, well, how about we just try to focus on getting them to run a little faster with better mechanics and maybe trying to get them to jump slightly higher and land well, right? Like those two things alone could be an enormously impactful thing for their performance, but also the, for their injury risk. And that is usually what Duesh does too with us when some people are like, you know, I, my vaults just don't go anywhere. You know, like it's frustrating because like I just can't seem to get higher on a vault no matter how hard I try. And then Duesh looks at their sprint mechanics and he's like, oh Lord, I'm like no one's taught you how to run ever in your life, right? Or they've never, they've never lifted a weight before. So their strength profile is probably lower than full capacity. Um, those two things alone, if, if in three months of a strength program, you can make meaningful changes in those two, the coach might be like, hmm, wait a minute here. Like, this is really interesting. And then you can tackle something else, right? So I've always approached it as the performance aspect, but also like you're saving them time. You just said it, right? Like you are saving them so much time when you can take off some of the work that's needed to research the science and see what's new and build strength programs that are maybe overwhelming for them and be more efficient with their warmups. Like you're going to save gymnastics coaches time so they get more time on the events, which is of course what they want. So speak, speak to what they want, not what you think they need. Yeah, exactly. I, like we're there to make the sport better, and and there's ways, like you said, there's ways to get the buy-in, isn't there? So, you know that like my my consultancy has like three pillars, which is sort of um, encourage, enhance, and protect. So, and we're talking about the two at the moment, aren't we? Of yeah, we're trying to protect or mitigate the risk of injury best we can, but also a big part of the job is to enhance them so mm. that they can they can do the best they possibly can at their sport. And I like to think of it as like a we call it like a ceiling of potential. So if you look at an athlete and that their strength scores are low or that you know that their strength profile is particularly low, you know, their ceiling of potential isn't isn't that high. 
where if I can increase that strength profile or, or get that power output up, it increases their ceiling of potential. Mm. So it means that they have all of this space to fill into with their gymnastics potential now, because actually it's not a physical thing that is letting them down. So if I, you know, that athlete can jump high and they can hit, you know, good splits or they're good in an overhead position or yada, yada, yada. That ceiling of potential is now higher. So they have the potential to then, you know, go as far as they then can for the sport. Mm. And we know that each athlete has a, a different ceiling of potential. That's just sport, isn't it? That's the reason none of us are all professional athletes. Yeah. Right? There's different people have different potentials. But I think if, if we can do the best job we can to raise that ceiling and have it as high as possible, then we have all that room to try and fill into, which is a really exciting thought. Mm. Um, and that's why, from a buying point of view, I will collect little bits of data. But I'm also a big advocate of you use the data that you collect. Mm. So we collect it and we store it and it's only me that looks at it i collect the data and then i use my ability to paint a picture to the coach of what's going on so for example i'll take peak power outputs so counter movement jumps i have some portable things i take with me to each club um, and we, we do it yeah we do monthly jumps and i will look at that data and sort of say who's gone up who's gone down is it expected is it unexpected if it's unexpected why what's the reason normally comp stress life stress like, you know, poor sleep, whatever it may be. Or it might be that that's the reason that the program has them at that point if we have them in a bit of a hole and we're trying to dig them out. But we use the data to paint a picture of where the athletes are physically, not just I go in, collect the data, save it on my laptop, and then I don't speak about it. Mm. Like the, the coaches know where they're at. Do they know what, I don't know, little Lucy jumps like a 27 point, whatever? No, they don't. But what they do know is they're improving or the average is going up or you know, month to month, we're getting the improvements we need in the little ones that we do the jump data with. It's, it's just trying to help. And that helps you get buy-in because you are showing them that the impact you're having as well. Mm, absolutely. But it's, it's not being over-reliant on it as well. It's having the confidence that they want you there. So you don't need to give them reams of data to read through to show your worth. It's just having enough to show that your impact, you know, you're having an impact on the program and it informs what I'm doing. So month to month, I can be like, right, we need to potentially look at this or that. And, yeah. you know, it allows for more fluidity in my mind in, in, in what we're doing. I absolutely love that. I really do. I like that you have, so, and we can go into this part of the conversation is, um, so we do this at Champion as well, is that when somebody comes to us for their first round of testing, we do, you know, our programming, we do the same stuff that you're talking about, right? We do a counter movement jump or a squat jump to kind of look at the difference of like force output versus elasticity. We do a, a 10 yard sprint test. We might do a shuttle test for lateral bounding, maybe an upper body test as well, but just very easy, meaningful things that we can do to show them that they're getting an objective outcome they want, which is power, right? Which is very much power and explosive uh, force development. However, I think it's really important to also to include some measurements that are specific to the sport that coaches find super duper valuable, right? So whether that's flexibility, split jumps, or, you know, passive flexibility, whether that is, um, skills, like getting certain skills that require those types of things, like, uh, or different things related to basics and like leg lifts and rope climbs and pull-ups or push-ups, like squats, like things that gymnastics coaches know for physical preparation are really, really valuable. And the hope is that by combining maybe a few general tests that have just proxies of power or elasticity, combining those things with gymnastics specific uh, physical preparation testing, like leg lifts or rope climbs or chin-ups or something like that. And then also having a few things about gymnastics performance, whether that's skill acquisition, whether that's angles of jumps or leaps, whether that's, you know, endurance, you have to have this nice little, um, you know, suite of things you do together to track month to month or week or, you know, throughout the course of a cycle, because you're going to give people, sometimes when you give coaches like, Hey, they jumped higher and they ran faster. It's like, okay, cool. But like, what does that mean for gymnastics? Like sometimes they don't really understand that. It's like, well, like look at also their vault you know, performances or look at like this kind of pull up or rope climb test is better or faster. I think then the light bulb goes off and then maybe they see some more, you know, objective things like, wow, she's running quicker. Like the, the vaults are actually higher. So I think that's what you need to do is you need to try to think about the low hanging fruit for those things and what to track that's easy, but also what's meaningful, you know? Yeah. Is it meaningful? Is it easily repeated? Does it take the least amount of time possible? Mm. Um, and those are the three. So if it's taken too long, there's a high chance you're never going to do that battery of testing again because you're wasting time. So, um, you know, it's and I totally get it. You know, I think when I first started out coaching, not in gymnastics, but coaching, I would do loads, loads and loads and loads. But then it was more now I try and whittle it down to what what is usable and what is impactful. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do like a lot of overhead screening. 
Um, we do some capacity testing in in sort of lower limb, upper limb that shows us how much they can endure training because obviously mm-hmm. we're trying to get them to endure training so they can have good quality training. And then obviously we do, like like you said, peak power and overhead and, and lots of like screening work as well. Mm. So That's good. Yeah. So let, let's talk about more nitty gritty then, right? Let's talk about like, so say you're going to a club and you're, you're, you're working with someone. What are the different approaches that you're taking throughout the season, right? Because that's another thing that I talk with a lot of college coaches and strength coaches together is they're not really sure what the role of a strength conditioning coach is throughout the entire year and how that changes. And maybe the off season, it makes loads of sense because obviously you're trying to get really strong. It makes sense. But as the preseason, as the in season comes, a lot of people are scratching their heads about like, why would I have a strength coach yeah. involved? We need to do, we need to do meets. Like all we need to do is more routines and we'll get better. So let's maybe start with, um, we're in the preseason right now, not to date the episode, but let's talk about what would be done in the preseason right now to try to help assist a club to get ready for meet season. Then we'll kind of shift gears. Yeah. So preseason, you're, you're sort of getting your athletes, the first thing is when you first go into a club, you need to structure things from a physical point of view. This happens here. This happens there. Create create a structure that and a framework that you can then landing where the, the strength work going to take place. Yeah. And then once you've got that framework, you can then bulk it out for the rest of the year. Then when you're in pre-season, obviously it's a it's a good opportunity to be you know pre-season. You're preparing the athlete for the sport to come up so you're looking at a gradual increase in load a gradual increase in workload and and you're sort of the one that is trying to just creep that up there but also there's no competitions so we've got to grab that opportunity with both hands and strangle it to death because we've got to get them as strong as possible and that's that's a really good opportunity because while they're learning new skills it's actually a nice time to sort of try and get them to be getting to produce more to produce more force basically Mm. Mm-hmm. to put it very crudely um so that's that's like the main aim because you're not going to then be impacting routines and and things that are later down the line but like you said the head scratcher comes doesn't it a little bit later on so where you've done you've done your strength work and that's what we are traditionally seen as mm-hmm. then, then what like then what is next so do you want me to go on to that yeah. So and just to frame it up, so the, the off season, you would use that f- time to get them as strong as possible. Right. Yeah. So now as you shut into the preseason, because I think I said the wrong thing. I think I said preseason by accident. So off season, we would want to get them as strong as humanly possible, get yeah. those new skills. As you go to preseason is what you're talking about now is, is that now we have an opportunity to bridge the gap between they got super strong in the summer here in the States elsewhere. Yeah. And then, but we have these three months of a window between like, we're getting ready for routines, but we still don't know what to quite do. And a lot of people get confused here because like, do I keep doing strength work? Do I have to do more like sprint work? Do I have to get like, you know, how do I get them fast? How do I get them quick? And so, yeah, what would you do in those three months between the summer and between the actual meet season that we're living in now? Yeah. So you start to bridge it, like you said. So it's not like flicking light switches on and off. It's a blend. So you, you're still doing some strength work, but the volume of it isn't isn't anywhere near as high as possible. So I do start to pull it back a little bit in the sense of we want them a little bit fresher. Mm. But then I do start to look at trying to put lay that building blocks of some rate of force development. So we know that that takes time to develop stiffness. And there are a lot of things that come before it. So I start to lay the foundation of are we doing some isometric work? Are we doing some jumping and landing? Are we doing some speed strength work that is not really classed as plyo, but it is definitely classed as power work. And we're sort of trying to get us ready for competition time so yeah that's that's the route i take with it is we we just pull everything out a little bit but we are still we're still training and we're still building Mm. and and that is definitely the the point but it's not as carefree because there's more considerations from my side and there's more considerations from the head coach Mm -hmm. yeah and and definitely on that mindset of still having a hybrid model is you can train explosive power and rate of force development in both settings right so on the gymnastics specific side things like tumbling up to mats or doing high uh vault timers to a high resi stack or doing very more aggressive explosive drills that can be happening in your gymnastics specific days right with with your specific work but then on your side you know if you have maybe one session or you have some time throughout the week you might be doing your sprint work your your med ball slams your sled pushes your explosive box jumps like those things are also still training the, the system of power and of rate of force development, but in a, in a very, very controlled and safe way. It's not just tumble as hard as you can and let's see how it goes. Yeah, no, no, exactly. You're exactly right. You're just trying to keep on the theme of what's going on, really. Mm. Um, but I will always try and thread in a bit of strength work, but it's just there 
it's just like a constant little feed just to keep everything in the system pretty happy and the tissue going on in the right place because these are still developing athletes. Mm. So that's why that stays in there because I'm looking like five years down the line, not sure. five months. Um, because in five years down the line, then we'll have a problem because they're not too strong. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how that's how we do it really. And and again, that's quite simple, isn't it? Is that's you know it's quite like a systematic approach. Is get them as strong as possible in off season, pre season. Look at that rate of force development and some power work. Keep threading in your strength work because it's still important. And then it's like the, then what do we do? Because we're coming up to comps or comps are happening, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And okay. one more thought on the power, because I think I get this one a lot, is I think with power work and rate of force development work, people sometimes don't understand how the athletes might not be always moving or doing really high volumes and really high sets. Like I think sometimes I see people doing like circuits, right? Like these like long 20 minute circuits of like jumps and sprints and running. And it's, it's continuous work. There's no off and on period. And I think when people come to champion, sometimes they see like um, some of the really high level athletes that we work with. Um, if gymnasts are going to like preseason, it's like we're actually only doing like a three by three or a four by three explosive velo based squat jump or squat, you know, with a barbell, or they're doing some like explosive sprint work with like two to four minutes of rest in between with other stuff filled in because we want to recover that energy system. Can you maybe share a little bit of insight into why it might not look like you're doing anything in some of these power sessions? Because I think sometimes coaches are like, what the hell did I hire you for? They're standing around for seven of the <laughs> to 10 minutes. Yeah. You're going to cause a riot, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it's understandable because they do just look like they're sitting around. But actually what you're doing is within the work, we're looking at speed of movement. I want that athlete to move quickly because what's the purpose of it? I'm trying to develop rate of force development. So that movement therefore has to be quick in order to send the right signal through. This is such crude science, but I'm going to go for it. I'm sticking with it, Dave. Um, okay. But then... You know, if I get them to do 25 of those, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to slow down. So is that is that the aim or the principle of what I'm trying to get out of it? It probably isn't. Mm. So I pick a rep range where I know that they can repeat it and the speed of movement is where I need it, in my opinion, three to five. Okay. Mm. Just kind of what the literature says that after three, we kind of slow down, but we can creep it to five if we're brave. We can go a bit more if we're even braver. Okay. But then we need some rest because the next set, I need that speed to be back because that's the idea of what we're trying to achieve. So what we do is we then just take a breather. So, and what I mean by that is we use the principle of rest in order for the system to recover. So then the athlete has the energy to then be able to produce the same am amount of force at the same rate again. And that's, and then that way we're training a physical quality that is going to help the gymnast to get better. Mm -hmm. So it always comes back to why are we doing this? So we're trying to develop a powerful gymnast. Cool. Well, let's give them a little bit of rest. So then their next set can be quick. So then they can develop the power. Mm. And I think that's the key thing. I think also in your rest period, you may put things in. Mm -hmm. If you know, if we don't want them just sitting around chilling, you may put things in that could be seen as useful. So like a couple of work on, you know, you may be doing some low level core work or stability work that threads in alongside it because we know that doesn't really disrupt mm. rest that's going on too much so i will use both as well so there'll be times where they will just sort of sit and we'll take that time period or there'll be a time where i've threaded something in that i still think is quite useful to be in yeah uh, you know we're, we're still trying to do that maintenance of of like a that protect element of the pillars that i use is still in there as well so there might be some like injury mitigation work in there as well so like injury prevention prehab whatever we want to call it. Mm -hmm. so that'll be in there the other thing i'll use to make sure that they're resting but without it look like they're sitting around is uh, there'll just be less equipment out so by having less equipment out the they have to wait for their turn mm. so while they're waiting for their turn there's nothing more that they can do except wait for their turn so they have to get some rest sure and that's actually quite a nice way of doing it as well because um as a coach it's quite easy to cut that rest short like i'm guilty of it and also as a gymnast, right, you just want to be getting on and working hard because they have yeah. the best will in the world, right? They're the hardest workers. So yeah. um, by just having less out there means that obviously you're creating an intentional little bottleneck, bottleneck within your program where they have to take rest at key times. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really interesting way of doing it as well because you're not having to stand there with a stopwatch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really, it's, it's important to really drive this concept home is that 
you have to, as a coach, in order for you to have buy-in that there, there has to be this kind of like built-in rest or time period between these explosive movements or lower volume, you have to understand some of the basic science of why that is, right? We don't, and I know you were struggling to keep it not geeky, right? But like understanding PCR and energy systems and understanding like the, the, the work to rest ratios with some of those substrates and, and explosive neural coding is really, really important because if you don't have that conceptual knowledge of why you're doing something, you're like, this is stupid. This is an absolute waste of time. And I, I think I'm, I'm completely like, you know, I have so many other things I could be doing right now. But at the same time, the examples that I see that I've made errors with in the past, right, is like, I think plyo lines over panel mats are the most like, just assaulted version of this, right? You set up 20 panel mats in a row, and the kids just jump over them with just like plyos just up and over, they go forward, and they go sideways, and they go backwards, and they jog back. And it's like 20 minutes of continuous low level plyos, like, what is the intention behind that goal? right? What are you trying to do there? If your goal is cardiovascular and energy systems, there are much better ways to train, you know, cardiovascular output than doing continuous work of plyos, right? If your goal is technical stiffness and shaping development, I don't know if 20 minutes of continual work is the best way to train technical development for stiffness. It's specific drills you need. And if the goal is to get, you know, more power within three lines, the kids are just like, you know, like no one's really jumping super hardcore. So the version of that that would be more efficient is something that Nick has talked to us a lot about is in the beginning of your, your dynamic warm up after you finish all of your stretching stuff, set up five mats in a row, and the most explosive tuck jumps over these mats you've ever seen in your entire life, high, high effort, right? So just five max effort jumps, followed by a variety of other shaping or core work, like you said, and do three rounds of that. That's 15 ground contacts, right? 20 minutes of panel mat lines is a recipe for gnarly shin splints if the kids aren't ready for it yet. So take your five really high quality jumps, do those three, uh, four, three to four rounds, right? And have other things in between. But that's training for explosiveness. That's training for high output, right? Same yeah. thing with like you do a general strength proc. Three sets of five depth jumps or, you know, something like that is way better than like two minutes of resi mat jumps all you're doing is causing lactate like just to build up in hydrogen ions to make it miserable you're not training jump you're not training stiffness doing 35 vault drills in a row at this back to back to back to back is not training explosive gymnastics specific work it's training getting tired you know and it sucks to say that because i've made that mistake but as a coach you have to resist the urge just to get kids sweaty and tired and instead have intention behind why you're doing stuff yeah, exactly. Particularly when it comes to that power work, there's a time for them to be like sweaty and yeah, you know, looking up to the heavens and and and. Kind of but there's also there's also times where, like you said, what is it we're trying to do? And if it's developing power, like you said, we need to just draw it back a little bit and and think about you know what a, what a low level plyo is, so we can do more of that for sure. But it still requires rest. Like you, you know, if you're doing little pogos, you still have to rest at some point in order to still get the efficientness of like building a foundation for high, high level plyo. If you're doing things like drop jumps, you know, after three or five, that, that co contact time is going to come right down. Yeah. And the idea is, is that we're trying to make sure that their contact time on the floor is, is sort of a really nice relationship of being as quick as possible with the most height. So it's, it's just using, using like the principles of training the right way, I guess is probably the way that you want to be doing it. And, and rest is a really important one. That's, that's overlooked it's like the exercises are normally correct it's the execution that sometimes maybe needs a little bit of a tweak sure. or be an explanation as to why why it's having that little bit of a tweak cool uh before we move on in season let's make this let's drive this all the way home because now people are like okay give me an example like like what do you mean like what would a workout look like so let's give someone like a very basic uh, so say you're working in a gym club and you are instructed to help with their power development in preseason. like what would be your very quick back of the envelope uh workout you might give to somebody um, so we'll be looking at uh, drop jumps or depth jumps. We'll mm -hmm. be looking at some, so that's a vertical. We'll be looking at horizontal, so broad jump. We'll be doing some single leg variations, like single leg bounding. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be doing some med ball work or throws or push presses and push jerks, depending on the club that I'm at. Yep. So we have a we have a real mix, but the you know all the exercises are ones that I think I've progressed to. So mm -hmm. I'll always lay the foundation early on as to what I want because it makes my life easier. And then also, you know, exercises that I know give me the result that I want for the, the rate of force development. So sure. I'm, choosing, I'm choosing a drop jump because I want vertical rate of force development and, and, yeah. and stiffness through the system. So that's the one I choose. The same with multiple broad jumps or bounds. It's the exact same reason is we can't just always go vertically. We need to do something horizontally. Sure. That's that's one of my go-to. And then how do I make some of these things 
more intense or a little bit more applicable, cool. We'll throw it onto one leg and just maybe drop the height of things or go for more distance or yep, exactly. Uh, but then, you know, the power is also a little bit difficult when we get to upper body, like it's not as, as yeah. simple as a solution. Yeah. So you've got to do things like throws or or um presses. Yeah. Or, or one thing I will do and that I've used quite recently is we'll look at changing the speed of the movement. So we'll do things like speed chin, speed pull up, speed press up. So yep. then plyometric in nature. But I'm I'm taking an exercise that we've done for the past twelve weeks and I'm just deloading it and telling the athlete to do it as quick as humanly possible. Sure. You'll soon see that actually whether they can do it or not. Um and it's a skill. The ability to relax and contract very quickly is a really, really important skill for them to learn. It's mm -hmm. fun. It's fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And so kind of what you said already is that you're kind of thinking in that three to five rep range. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you might do one A and one B would be the depth vertical jump. And then maybe you have a speed push up or a speed rope climb or chin up or something like that. Then maybe a core movement to kind of give them a rest between those first two. So that'd be like a set of five vertical jumps, a set of five plyo or speed push ups, and then maybe a couple, some sort of core exercise that you want to do. But that would give them enough rest time to get to the top where their legs are maybe fresh from the first one. So you'd have those first triplets and then maybe another triplet of broad jumps or single leg jumps and then some some upper back work, right? Does that sound about on par? Yeah, like that's that's one way of doing it is like you said, using and manipulating it so they work through and come back or we just pair it and contrast it with something that is really useful. So like some squatting and some some box jumping or drop jumping yep. or and we'll use like a little pairing that just is really obvious. That it's a really nice partnership. So. It, it sort of depends on where where I'm at at the gym, which gym it is, what equipment they have, how many gymnasts they have, how long they've been training for. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more just how do we how do we work the space to get what we need out of it? Sure. And just having a very clear out, out outcome on that. So on my program cards, I give the clubs. It's like what is like there's a big like logo, and then there is literally like a what block is this and what we're trying to achieve. Sure. Um, and then that just makes it really clear to read through after that, right? Is oh, we're in power, therefore that's why there's not loads of stuff in this pack that I've I've been sent. Right, right. Again and again, that might be that might be a 40, 45 minute workout with only seven exercises, right, and only three to six sets. But yeah. I can tell you from experience from the athletes who have seen notable changes in their like sprinting speed or vaulting performance or floor and tumbling stuff or upper body power development. They, they don't really understand at first why there's maybe not as much in the program. Like they don't have 94 exercises to get through, but the, with the intention being the goal of like, no, I want you to put this med ball through the wall. I want you to touch the ceiling. I want you to like literally run out of your own shoes. You're running so fast. They, like you said so well, they're training for the quality you want, which is explosive speed, right? They're not training for half ass kind of effort kind of things here and there for 20 minutes. They're training for seven seconds of melt your face off, which is what we want. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it comes down to how do we educate the athletes about that as well. So we spend a lot of time talking, you know, about the, the coaches and, and getting them to buy in, but also like getting the gymnast to understand that your rest is actually really important. Mm. So, uh, and then once they buy into that, obviously, then they, they, they enjoy the experience a lot more as well, because it's just a bit calmer. So what a lovely opportunity to have a calmer training environment, right? Because when you're working, you're working super hard. But the agreement is also, if you're not, then actually we have some rest time to, you know, we can potentially be a little bit more social or we can do things that are going to help us with other work-ons that the coaches have um, identified as well. Mm. So then, you know, they buy into it as well because this is like really useful time for us now. So what can we yeah. do in it or how can we yeah. use it? Can I just sit back and enjoy it? Or you know, yeah. but when I'm working, like watch me work. And that's the deal. That's the deal yeah. that, that I have with my gymnasts, yeah. Cool. So yeah, I think we've we've definitely tabbered on uh, preseason pretty well. So let's talk about in-season stuff because this is another area that when I talk with college coaches, um, coaches, gymnastics coaches, sometimes rightfully so, struggle to see the value of a strength conditioning coach in season uh, for maintenance care. And then a strength conditioning coach sometimes struggles to see how they can add more to the equation when there's already so much being done. Like there's so much routines and there's so much volume. So what is your approach to in-season management with uh, clubs that you work with? And then I can maybe jump in a little bit and share too. Well, we're, well, we're in this right now. So yeah. um, right from the beginning is your, your role has changed. It's competition time. So you're not, you're not steering the ship as much physically. Um, what you're trying to do is ensure that output remains high. So we are doing some plyo work, but we're using it sparingly at the right times. You know, we are touching on some tissue conditioning to make sure that they're remaining healthy and not just fully detraining mm. like during this time period. 
And then it's also just my role has changed. So am I spending a little bit more time one-on-one -on -one with gymnasts doing what we would look at like um, like an MOT or a service? So is everything still good? Is, is anything starting to get a little bit achy or sore? Or are we losing range in certain areas that's causing an issue? Because if it is, we can give you specific work-ons to do because the rest of your physical prep work potentially isn't as, as, as super, super intense. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to just fine-tune the athlete at the time uh, and the squad as a whole of what we're doing. So are there little bits and bobs that we can be doing to create some more rotation and, and help us out so we remain healthier? Because that competition time is so intense for, for gymnast and coach. And then... You know, are we trying to keep that output? So we've worked all this time period. Don't just stop and think that they're going to hold it forever because they're not. What you've got to do is try and find the opportunities within that period of comp to sprinkle in a bit of stimulus to try and keep the keep everything as high as possible to give them the best possible outcome of being successful. Mm -hmm. So it changes. It changes a little bit. It, you've got to be a little bit more tactful about how you go about things. You've got to spend a lot more time one-on-one -on -one with the gymnasts and make sure that you've spent time creating relationships with them so that they tell you what is sore or what they maybe need a little bit of help with. And similarly to the coach. So when you go in, you sort of get given a list of, could you have a look at X, Y, and Z with so-and-so because this is what I'm seeing or this is what I've been told. So the things that you do just, just change. I like this time because it's very detail orientated. So I get to be a little bit nerdy. Um, and again, because you spent time standing side by side by the coach, you don't just feel like you're standing there twiddling your thumbs now because you've always done it. Yeah, You're just getting to watch them do what they do best, which is routines and do skills and refine things. So actually, it's a really nice period to be involved in. And, and I actually feel very privileged to be part of it because it would be very easy for them to be like, you're not necessarily need to be here as long. But because you offer value in other areas of what we do, we'd love you to be here. So... Mm you know, you, you create that opportunity for yourself to, to be there and witness that. But it's such a privilege to just watch them. Then, you know, you've seen someone learn a skill and now you're seeing them string it together in a full routine. And I think that's just like the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Yep. Um, and, and that just drills home. If I ever do lose sight of what it is I'm trying to do is it's not really about the numbers. It's about what they're doing. Sure, sure. And, yeah. And then I'll go to competitions and watch as well for the exact yeah. same reason as like, yeah there's nothing more important to this gymnast right now than this. So I'll always try and get to a couple of within the year as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I agree. I think that the the places that I've seen that are the most successful are the strength conditioning coach understands how their role shifts into a maintenance care mode. So whether it is doing a handful of exercises, like the power stuff, the rate of force development stuff really at a low volume, but a high intensity to try to maintain some of the progress that you've made in the preseason. But also too, is I think this is a really good opportunity for strength coaches to really put on their, slightly medical hat as well and work with pts work with ats work with sports chiros or doctors to be like okay what do these athletes need during season to stay healthy right like you said do they need more shoulder flexibility range because the more you train the more routines you do the stiffer you get right the more you work on your hips and your and your stuff for form and you're really doing a lot of volume your hamstrings and your your adductors and your hip flexors and stuff might get really overworked and stiff maybe then you become more of a, a maintenance care mode of trying to just maintain their flexibility maintain their mobility and that helps them perform quite a bit better and get a better score like it's a huge thing to do and so i see a lot of places that are really good at filling in the gaps, right? They understand I have so much that needs to be done in the gymnastics specific time with routines and with extra corrections. And there's really not a lot of extra time to get some of the stuff done. If you can help them, you know, by deloading that role and by taking on the, the, the maintenance care work, the prehab type work, the, you know, the chasing, not chasing kids, but get, make reminding kids politely to do their extra boring work. It's maybe not the most fun stuff. We're doing that on a light day, right? Like those are things that are so, so valuable to um, a lot of the coaches to have. And then back full circle is really implementing some of your monitoring work, like talking about sleep, educating the athletes about, you know, packing their snacks to fuel for performance and hydration and stress management, schedule management, like strength coaches have an enormous role to help bring some of that education to athletes and have them really have the best competitions they can. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, um, you also have a role and it, it's it started out obviously not in gymnastics, but you have a role where obviously you're not the one choosing skills or creating routines or, you know, you, you don't directly impact their gymnastics. So therefore, you know, you can sometimes have some more information disclosed to you about what potentially is going on or why are they stressed. Sure. And then obviously they know that that gets fed back, right? But but it's just, 
it's just having another person in the gym who has like a supportive manner and, and particularly if you're as an SSC coach using that time for those like ensuring that they're healthy and, and giving them some work ons and looking and seeing if everything's working that's a really nice opportunity isn't it because you've got the athlete in front of you one-on-one -on -one, and you know you're sort of saying to them you know how are things how's this feeling are you stressed how's school you know and and you'll be surprised some of the things that crop up sometimes and then that sometimes explains why what you know certain things are going on as well and then you can refer them out if you need to refer them out to physios or or you know it just helps paint a picture of actually they're really struggling with school sure Therefore, you know we know academic stress plays a massive massive role in athletic performance in these sort of student athletes so yeah it's it it's a really nice period like i said like i i enjoy it like i, I love it when it's like right we've got a really good period and we're going to work really hard, but I like this bit because it's about what difference can you make in the softer stuff. Mm. And I think all the fun stuff is on the edges. So yeah. around the edges of my job is the bit that I sometimes enjoy more. Yeah. Um, and, sure. and, yeah. And like you said, and they're happy because they're, you know, it's competition time. They're, they're, <laughs> I'm lying in the sense of they'll be stressed as well. Yeah. But you know, this is why they do the sport that they do sure. um, as well. And, and you can see that in them is, they just get a bit spicy don't they they enjoy it and yeah um spicy. yeah spicy is the perfect uh, the perfect term for it yeah it's like competition mode isn't it is you know i work with sports that compete every week so i see it on a weekly basis of like their mentality fully change by the time they've played on wednesday they become way calmer and then it comes around again and it's the same thing with gymnasts isn't it is they're just constantly always working towards this thing yeah. and then you see them in comp mode and it's just i don't know you just feel quite proud don't you just to be to be involved and you know privileged just to be able to help them on the way and hopefully they, they, they feel a benefit from it along the way as well yeah absolutely it's that mutual kind of like you know they obviously are doing the work another one reaping the benefits but it's that mutual pursuit towards a common goal you know what they want to accomplish and i think i we we've done extensive off-season lectures like we have like three full podcasts together with nick about what the role of a strength coach is off season so like literally one of which i forgot about till now is like we like handmade a program from scratch between the three of us so like for off season let's let's just like point you in the direction of something more comprehensive because that that's like a multi-port episode it could be i'd rather talk about some of the real like kind of elephant in the room things which is how how to maybe work in an environment that's still challenging, right? So I think I hear from a lot of people, I hear actually from gymnastics coaches who have taken an interest in strength conditioning and have gotten their CSCS or have gone back and done their kind of work to become more educated on the weightlifting, on the periodization, on the yearly management, about them trying to open a discussion or a dialogue around change, around, I know we've done this for 10 years. I know we've done only gymnastics specific and we've always followed this model and just more and more and more, but I think there's a better way or a strength coach like yourself who is maybe in, in a club and is now going through their first year they're trying to get situated and it's just like you're really fighting a, a an uphill battle it feels like you're pushing a rock uphill that keeps rolling back on you so what do you do or what are your experiences trying to work with coaches who maybe are resistant to new ideas or resistant to change or particularly i hear from parents who are like you know there's so many people that are injured at the club and there's so many people that are not getting what they want or are leaving the gym club, but they refuse to change their ideas about strength and conditioning or how they do things. What are you, what's your kind of ground level advice for working with some of these clubs? Um, I think it's, there's always low hanging fruit. That's really simple to get. So, you know, I will, I'll never try and go into somewhere and, and just make wholesale changes because a lot of the stuff that they're doing is correct. Mm. So, and I think the the worst mistake you can make as an SNC coach when you go in somewhere is change everything because what you're basically telling that person who has lovingly put that program together is that it's wrong. Yeah. Which actually, a lot of the time, it it, re it really isn't. There's some really good stuff being done. Yeah. So, sit back and watch is my first bit of advice. So, if you're going to be there long term, why are you trying to change everything within three weeks? Is it because you know you're not going to be there long term? Yep. So, watch and figure out. What are they doing well? What can I maybe help with? What's the easy stuff to help with? So make a list of these are the areas that I think could do with potentially changing or doing a little bit differently. Cool. Then make that list into which one of these are really accessible for me to make change to um, without causing any cause for concern. Mm -hmm. Get those done first. They will make an impact if you've made the right decision and you've impl implemented the right things, then you start to get a little bit of buy-in and then you just move on to the next bit on the list and the next bit on the list and then the next bit on the list. And then before you know it, 
that you're building the trust with the coach. And it's really important because it's, it is actually earned. It's not just, oh, you're here, therefore I now should have the respect of you. Is You're naive to think if you don't go into a gym club, they're not watching you to see whether you're making a change or not. Um, and you'll soon find out if you're not. Mm. So, because you won't be there. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's the way is just try not to make wholesale changes. Um, you know, if, if, and if you have these big plans of grandeur about making really big changes, change one thing a year for mm. five years. If, you know, if you want to think that way. So, you know, I've been at certain clubs for three years now, sadly, one of them was during COVID. But, you know, we would maybe make one big change per year. But actually now we've had three fairly decent, significant changes at those clubs that I've been at for a year. And it's and it's come as no shock or surprise because we've discussed it for a year before it happens. And then we've discussed it for a year mm. before it happens. So, yeah, that's my advice to the S&C coaches, that if that's how you were to do it, it's just pick the things you know you can change that mm. are going to cause, cause like massive and sort of conflict too quickly and then you know that the higher conflict stuff maybe comes a little bit later down the line but what you'll find is the stuff that you thought would cause conflict if you have a good working relationship after a while doesn't really cause conflict once they trust you sure um, it's yeah the same. go ahead yeah, Jack. It's, it's the same the other way around isn't it if you work with a physiotherapist or a you know like i'm like with a head coach is you, you just learn to trust each other more don't you the more sure. time you spend and the more results you get you just back each other more so it's like okay You've explained it to me. I probably need to see it. Show me and, and we'll see and we can reflect and go on it. Yeah. You took the words out of my mouth because I made this exact error when I was a young, I was coming out of grad school for uh, PT school, but I also was getting more involved in strength conditioning. And once I, it's, it was a positive thing. It was meant well that once I saw how much more was out there in the strength conditioning world that we could use, I was like, oh my Lord, like, look at how much stuff we could do. We could, we could do so much more that could be so much faster and so much more strong and powerful. But I think I made the mistake of trying to bite off way more than I could chew, but also of not taking the time to educate the other coaches and the athletes about why in a simple way, in a very simplistic way about what we are going to do, like why we had to change a little bit and then what we were going to do to implement those changes. Right. So whether it was, you know, changing the way that we approached our um, warm up, right. Or changing the way that we approached one or two of our days of, of strength and conditioning and saying about like, yes, well, instead of like, you know, just throwing a bunch of terminology at them saying like, well, you know, this is how you get explosive power. It's force in, in time. And so we need to work on the force piece in the off season, which is, you know, the literature supports is a combination of body weight type strength training, and then also external weightlifting. And if I just been that simple with it, I mean, like, so we want to find the right, you know, squatting or deadlifting or single leg movements that are beneficial that we can do a little bit to try to build that strength component that should make them faster, you know, potentially more faster when we get to the preseason. Like, I think a lot of people would be like, Oh, I get that. That makes conceptual sense. And they would have been buying, right. Instead of me just being like, here's this giant new strength program with all these exercises that half the coaches don't know how to teach or coach. And they feel really, they feel a little insecure about that. You know, I think a lot of coaches are a lot of strength coaches. Sometimes, like you said, kick the door in and kind of like say all the things that need to change and all the things that are you know, maybe not going super well, not realizing how much experience coaches have and how much they are doing a lot of things. Right. Loads. Yeah. Like, you know, you've got to appreciate that a lot of the coaches you're working with, I had a conversation with a coach, for example, this week, um, where, she said she coaches the children of some of the gymnasts she used to coach. All right. So that's how experienced some of these coaches are. So if you don't sit back and take, take heed of that as that person is really experienced and they, they deserve the respect, mm. that, you know, you're going to their gym. You're not there to tell them that they're doing everything wrong. You know, I, I, yeah, I think it's naive. I think they have a lot of experience. They're just not familiar with, the S and C stuff, as they shouldn't be, really. For, you know, from from like being a, a pure technical coach, they're getting to the point where they're learning more now, and I think that's incredible. But it's no different to the same way if you're a new S and C coach and you know nothing about gymnastics, you know nothing about gymnastics, and it's the exact same thing. So, you know, m my big advice would be exactly. I was really fortunate to have that relationship. Is I went and me and Nick learned off each other, and we just traded advice rather than trying to tell each other what to do probably yeah. the way yeah. to do it is you know we all knew quite a lot in our own areas and then we we traded it and we pushed it together and we saw what worked mm -hmm. and it was a really nice way to learn and trade information as opposed to like this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is sure wrong. you're only going to get people's backs up like if you do that with me i'm not going to enjoy it <laughs>
but naturally it's a natural response isn't it if someone tells yeah. you you're not doing a good job about something and you think you are you're naturally going to get your back up where if you you're trading information and you see it as that i think that's that's the better way to work together as, mm. as, as staff members and also too i think you and nick probably had some times where you maybe did not friction is not the word i want to use but you had professional disagreements about the way to approach things or you maybe didn't really understand you know i don't think that's the best way and i think that is also something super duper valuable is if you have enormous respect for the person as a whole and you have a combined secure position of where you're coming from about like, I'm just trying to help and do the best thing. I don't really care about me being the focus. I keep, keep, uh, care about the kids and the athletes getting the most out of this. It allows you some times where you can have some back and forth and ping pong back into what you think might be right. And there were plenty of times that thankfully, because the coaching staff that I worked with are amazing, like Eva and some other people is that like we, we were able to try things but then they were honest with me when they were like listen this is this is not a good fit so you know mel or just the other coaches i work with would literally just be like listen good intentions but let's go back to the drawing board and think about maybe a different way to approach this and there were other times when i would bring something to them that like, this is amazing let's use it as is so i think you have to be secure enough in your own approach to have a nice fluid conversation back and forth but you also need to be willing to admit when maybe like eh, you know that didn't that didn't go as well there's so many things i've tried and they've completely blown up in my face and i was like well we're not gonna try that again yeah no i think you're 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 absolutely correct i think it's you know you're still there to support so everything you take isn't always going to get the green light mm. um and that's fine just take it on the chin <laughs> yeah it sucks um but also that's part of the role isn't it like i'm not the one who's going to fall on the sword at the end of the day like i'm there to help the person that does so you know, you've got to respect that decision is it, it does come back down to that coach if that athlete doesn't do very well, not you, them. So they, they do have that final say. And then like you said, when it comes to disagreements, it's just a professional disagreement. So yeah, there, there probably were times where it's hard to think of one, but it's, there, there will have been times where it would have been like, oh, I'm not sure about that. And it maybe took a bit more time to, to get around to it. But you've also just got to remember that you're, you're at work and you don't have to agree with what everyone says. It's the way you disagree with it. Like you said, if they say to you, listen, this just isn't really working the way that we thought it would. Is there another way of doing it? I'm sure you were the first person to fire back with like 10 solutions, right? So cool. Scrap it. Here's 10 more. And it's like, well, take your pick of those. So yeah, I mean, I think it is just a bit of pushing and pulling and it's, it's not saying that you're fully subservient to the head coach as a support staff, but it is just, you know, there's a role to play. And the way you play it is what makes you, you know, successful at your job, really. Because if you don't get the buy-in, you can literally have, you could literally be sat here with the best program in the world for gymnastics right now. But if you don't buy into it, the gymnasts are going to sense it. And if the gymnasts don't buy into it and the coaches don't buy into it, they're not going to do it. And then they're not going to do the program to the best of its ability. So you're not going to get the results you want. So you end up on this like negative spiral mm. where coach buys into it and the gymnasts buy into it the program can have a couple of flaws or holes in it but you're still going to get the results you want because everyone's doing it the right way mm. and you know you're going to be more successful so it's not disregarding it and i think it's because we disregard it because it's called like soft skills yeah um but i think if they were called like coaching fundamentals or something i think people maybe maybe take them a bit more seriously but yeah they're they're the things that get the athletes to do your program mm. so you know, I would, I would develop that as well as your technical knowledge alongside it. Yeah. Very great advice. And I think my last piece of parting advice is to, unfortunately, there's still some situations where very, very prominent people in our sport who are phenomenal technical clinicians, um, maybe are imparting or passing down some advice that's really not in line with the current evidence that we have and kind of the new things that we're saying about strength conditioning or about physical preparation or, you know, energy systems. And so in those moments, I would never do this on the floor in front of athletes with people, but I would try to pull those people aside and ask them very directly. And I've, I've done this with some super duper high level uh, coaches and I'm like, listen, I, I heard you say this thing, or you thought this thing. Um, and can you just explain to me why you think that is, you know, what's the, the rationale or the thought process behind doing 20 minutes of panel mats or doing, you know, four sets of a hundred squat jumps when you're trying to get more explosive power, like what, what's your thought process there? And, and usually it comes to is they, they share with you some rationale that is like, Eh, I don't know if that's really the most scientifically supported and like in your head, you're thinking like, 
ooh, no, yeah. And then you can have a conversation fluidly about, like, yeah, it's interesting you think that. I used to actually think that too. And I used to really not be, uh, you know, super up to date with what I've been going on. But like there's some some really great studies, there's some really great literature, there's some other sports that do this. And this is why they do it because of these kind of hard facts. And it's, it's no longer about them. And it's no longer about you being right with a big ego or them getting their ego bruised. It's about facts and it's about straightforward data and science right and even you with your data collection it's like yeah well we can actually see an improvement in these five girls or these six girls who were doing this type of program this is beneficial and so i think that's that's hard to do sometimes is humbly talk with those people and be like okay well why don't you agree with that right and then, then you dig down into the well of what's going on and for most people if they have you know a mildly checked ego they'll be open to those kind of conversations there are some times when i've had some conversations with people and i've been like listen man like you're, you're not even on this planet with how much op like you being open to any new ideas. And so I'm sorry you feel that way, but like, I think you're wrong. I, I really do. I just don't agree with you. We can have a professional disagreement. That's fine. Good luck. I'm going to go my way. You go your way. But I don't, I don't believe that your line of thinking has really good scientific support at it. And it is what it is. And I just leave it at that. And those are the people back to the beginning of the podcast. I just don't try to force it anymore. No, I think, I think like I said, I was the same. Like if we go back to what I said at the beginning is I'm just really fortunate because I, you know, I work with um, coaches that that are just so receptive to it. So, mm. but like you said, there's nothing wrong with having that conversation because, like you said, we, we literally just say you're allowed professional disagreements. The way you do it, it has to be professional, though. So, which is exactly what you've just stated. I think always offering solutions when you go into that environment mm. uh, is really important. So, okay, that's cool. You're trying to achieve this. Um, have we thought about potentially looking at it this way, or this way, or this way, or this way, or yeah. this way? And then you, you know, you can you can sort of steer rather than yank and pull them in the direction you want to go. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way. I, I'm really fortunate. I've not I've not really had to be in that situation in gymnastics. In in my other role, um, yeah, for sure. You, and and if you don't agree with someone, that's fine. Um, you know, it would be easy if we did all just agree with each other. But you know, in gym, I'm super lucky. Like uh, work with coaches that just are very very open and very easy to to just share information with and if you provide them a solution they they generally take it and i'm really i'm, I'm a consultant so that's why yeah. i'm there sure. so they, they understand that as well so how can we do this better should we tried this cool yeah. um but you know if if there is somewhere where there is just a very you know we're just completely two different directions um that's fine you know maybe i'm not the coach for that gym yeah and, and that's fine as well because you will find someone who who will have a really good fit for your gym as well, and that is absolutely fine. It's probably just I'm not I'm not the right fit because then we're always just going to friction the gymnasts aren't yeah. going to fit, and that's why I'm there at the, the end of the day. It's going to be awkward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, as always, man, great conversation, great advice. I just looked up and it's we're well over an hour now, so I yeah. didn't like think about that. But as always, uh, tons of valuable information. I appreciate you and I appreciate everything that you're doing. So um, I'm sure people will have some follow-up questions or would want to kind of maybe get your uh, your eyes and ears. So where can they find you if they would like to? Um, so Instagram is probably the easiest. So Dan Lonsdale SC. Uh, I have a website, danlonsdale.com, where you can send me emails or inquiries. On there, you can sign up to a newsletter as well that I'll send out. But yeah, if you have any questions on this stuff, you know, absolutely feel free. And I'll always try and endeavor to to find the answer. And if I can't, I'll ask someone who can and pass that on to you. So yeah, I'll always I'll always try and help you out. But yeah, any questions, feel free. And you know, I'm always trying to put content out there that's useful as well. Cool, man. Absolutely. We appreciate it, buddy. All right. All right. Take care. Later. See you later.